we're done. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to just kind of try to stay right here, you know, through the presentation. Um, tonight, the, the, this is the public hearing for our first rating. We say first, but in education, you have an acronym for everything. So first rating stands for Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas. The first slide is, might be the most difficult to follow, though. Um, so this is a report on our 2019 rating based on our 18-19 fiscal year and we get to present it in our 2021 school year. So, and that's the way it works every year and that's the, might be the hardest slide to follow. Uh, but we'll go through it uh, here and we'll get to the end of it. Again, the first system is the state's accountability rating or system for school districts. Uh, it's Basically, as a district, we submit certain financial, financial data to TEA, including our audit, our annual audit. Uh, the TEA assigns financial accountability rating to each district. And uh, one of the requirements of the first rating of the first system is that we uh, give public notice and have a public hearing so we can share this data with our community. Um, again, just overall purpose is to ensure that school districts are held accountable for the quality of their financial management practices. Uh, and then it also allows you, to, it gives you data so that you can improve on your performance in future years. Uh, if, if you will, it's the STAR test or the EOC test in the financial business world for the schools, essentially. Um, timeline for this, again, this is better described or better explain the first slide we were on. So in August of 2019, we closed the 18-19 budget. In November 2019, uh, our auditors were here and they presented our audit to the school board. That November presented the 1819 audit. November 19th, that's when we submitted our financial audit to TEA. And usually it's the day after that board meeting or two days after that board meeting. And the auditor is the one that submits that data to TEA for us. Um, then August 2020, so the August we were just in, is when we get that first rating for the 1819 uh, fiscal year, but it's the first rating for the 1920 school year. <laughs> and then we still in September and we can give the 1920 first rating during our 2021 school year. Right? Just like Texas education, we make it difficult. Again, it's the requirements to publish it in uh, the newspaper. So on September 9th is when our notice ran in the Navasota Examiner. Um, then first report, conflict of interest, uh, disclosures, IOISD is all on the website. If it's not there, it will be there in the morning. Um, and if you look at the top of our website, you have the main menu bar and it says departments. If you click on departments, that'll drop, you can drop down menu. If you see business and finance and that drop down menu, that's where you can find all this information. Uh, the district rating is based on 15 indicators. The first five of those indicators are uh, crucial or crit they're labeled critical, I call them crucial. Um, and they're yes or no. And if you have a no, it's a possible automatic failure if you have a no on one of the first five. Uh, I believe the first indicator uh, was the completed annual financial review. The audit submitted to TTA within 30 day deadline of 30 days of the January 28th deadline. And uh, yes, ours was for that year. It was uh, submitted to TEA on January 9th. Uh, indicator 2A, so 2 is broken up into two different parts. Was there an unmodified opinion in the audit um, as a whole? And yes, actually enrolled our auditors uh, at an unmodified opinion with that audit November 19th. I apologize, the first slide, this slide right here, that should say in January. No, that's correct. Well, no, it's not. It should say, uh, it should say November 19th as well. Uh, 2B, the, did the external independent auditor re report that the AFR was free of any instances of material weaknesses in internal controls over financial reporting compliance for local, state, and federal funds? Uh, yes, it was uh, free of that. Again, actually wrote, made that determination, and it was for November 19th. Indicators 3 and 4 here on the same slide. The school district can compliance with payment of terms 
all debt or agreements at the fiscal year end? Yes. Uh, did the school district make timely payments to TRS, uh, Workforce Commission, IRS, and other government agencies? Yes. And then the last indicator uh, was the total unrestricted net asset balance in the government activities column. And the statement of net assets greater than zero. And the answer to that was yes. So I went back and looked at that. I believe that the net assets in that column were 1.2 at the time. But we also meet this indicator with uh, the qualifier there. It says the school district's change of students membership over the last five years, 10% or more than the school district passes this indicator. We pass it that way as well because our, our student growth has been at least 10% over the last five years. So that's the first five indicators. Thank goodness we had all the guesses. But like I said, it could be an automatic failure if you had another one of those. Then we go to the uh, next 10 indicators, 6 through 15. And this is where we uh, get the calculation that gives us the numerical score. If you remember last year, I lost score to 94 on the remaining indicators, and we lost uh, six. Well, we lost points on, on only one indicator, and that was indicator six. This year, uh, indicator six through 15, we made 800. We lost no points. The website there, I know that's a whole lot there. But that would take you directly to the report. But again, this is going to be posted linked on our website as well. If you want to look at that report. Uh, what I have here, I'm sorry, that was the best I could do. I'm trying to explain what you see there. This is indicator six, the only one I'm going to cover. The reason I'm covering it is because the year before is, is the one we lost uh, points in. This year we did not. Uh, the first few red letters or blur you see up there it just says Iowa ISD. The next is the indicator. And it says, was the number of days on, of cash on hand and current investments in the general fund for the school district sufficient to cover operating expenditures? When you go to this report, over here, I don't even know, it's so blurry and small. Over here, it tells you the mathematical operations for these numbers here. So for this indicator, you have the two uh, rectangles at the top. Those two numbers will be added together. One, is a, one of them is zero. And then it will be divided by the sum of these two boxes. When you do that, you come up with a math mathematical breakdown of 114, which is this. It gives you the score right here, 114. So once you have that score, you can look across here to see the points you earn. And if you go over here, it says greater than or equal to 90. You get 10 points. Well, that was 114. It was greater than 90. So we earned all 10 points this year. It's essentially our fund balance that we grew um, during that fiscal school year. So again, our rating for our 1920 first rating was 100. That's an A or superior. This is significant as we move forward with our facilities committee. And we start looking at trying to do some different things uh, for our district. If we ever got to the point where the, the school board, the community facilities committee thought we wanted to do something with another bond election, this is significant because this plays a role in our credit score essentially we would be uh, receiving if we tried to pass a bond. Um, so that's good news for us. Other disclosures that are part of the first rating, superintendent's contract, uh, reimbursements received by superintendent and board members, outside compensation if I did any uh, consulting work, gifts that might be received by the superintendent and board members, and business transactions between the district and board members. So I'll cover each one of those right now. Uh, superintendent contract is posted online. Again, in our top menu bar, if you select our district, in that drop down menu, you'll see uh, superintendent. If you click on that, at the bottom of that screen, it says contract. You can click on there and you'll see my current contract. Uh, disclosure two was reimbursements received by superintendent and school board members for that fiscal year. I don't know if you can see it. It has the board members going across there. And it was zero for all the board members. For me, it was $2,428. And that was all for mileage during that school year, which is part of my contract, out of district mileage. So that's what that uh, reimbursement was for. Disclosure three. Again, uh, any consulting work I did, if I did some and I received payment for that in another district, uh, that's where this will be reported. I haven't done any. I've received no uh, additional money due to consulting. 
four was gifts that we may have received. Uh, you can see neither I nor any of the board members received any uh, gifts. In disclosure five, uh, business transactions between the school district and board members. And again, there were no transactions between the district or any board members for that fiscal year. That is the end of our presentation. If I have, if there's any questions, pretty simple. We're doing real well. Thank you to the board. So essentially, this fiscal year would have been my first year superintendent. So I want to thank my board for guiding, directing me, giving me feedback, helping me through that process. Uh, Ms. Tim and Ms. Uh, Ms. Botcher are not here tonight, but I want to thank them uh, because they helped this rating also. If it wasn't for Ms. Tim's good work balancing our books and Ms. Botcher's good work of getting the bills paid in a timely manner, we would have had this 100. So I want to thank those two people and I thank you, the board, for guiding and directing me in my first year as superintendent. Uh, this was uh, a team effort. And it's paid off for us. I appreciate you. Any other questions or discussion or conversation? Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. I remember there is one last slide, and now this is done. Um, again, I, I mentioned this last year. Go ahead and mention it again. Uh, the first rating, the rating system is changing. Uh, so you'll see a few more indicators next year going from 15 indicators to 20. Uh, some of those new indicators cover things like ADA projection, but we've been talking about that as a team of eight. We're worried about where do we set that number at. So we'll receive a score for that, any difference in PEAMS data and our AFR, and uh, then there's a whole new uh, checks and balances for compliance with grants, contracts, and laws related to local federal funds. Uh, the last time we talked about this, there were going to be 21 indicators. So as we're getting closer to that time, we lost one of those new indicators. We're down to 20. I think that's a real plus. I think the one that may have went away had to do with the variance in fund balance. Uh, maybe a, enough districts spoke, spoke up and, and they decided to edit that. So again, I apologize. I am going to now. Second by Lou, the flavor of your hand, question the carry. Public forum. Do we have anybody sign up to speak over there? Yes, sir. All right. So we'll pass public forum to item number four. Consideration of the Senate agenda. Do you receive any questions? No, sir. I did not receive any questions. Um, so I just recommend the board of three. Motion by Karen, second by Andy. Put the favor, raise your hand. Motion carries out Item number five, campus and administrative reports. You know this is just getting ladies first. All right. Um, since our last meeting, we have had uh, parent orientation. It was done virtually over the course of about a week um, as it fits schedules of um, teachers. So they came up here and they did a Zoom for parent orientation and took questions. Um, we have parent-teacher conferences coming up next Monday uh, at the elementary. So teachers will be holding those either in person, they can do it on Zoom, or they can do it by phone. So lots of options for families. Also, we have this year we have a new um, kinder through second grade reading um, we had some updates from the state that said it gave like a list of things that we could use that were um, free to our district. Um, and so we went with in class and it's by Amplify. Um, it's off the commissioner's list and we decided that we wanted the same screener for kinder through second and not a bunch of different ones where you couldn't see data from year to year. Uh, this year also uh, TEA is offering a beginning of the year assessment specifically to find those gaps um, from um, the closure in the spring. So fourth through sixth grade, we'll be taking that. Uh, the window closes October 16th. So I'm working with the teachers on setting a schedule for when they're gonna do the assessments. Um, it's gonna offer a really good piece of data for us to look at and see what teaks were not covered last year or that the kids may have forgotten going into this year. So for example, fourth grade, we take an assessment created by TEA on 
third grade teams. So it's going to give some good information for our teachers, craft, and instruction this year. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Good evening. So we've had a lot going on, as you guys probably can imagine. Um, <clears throat> things are really looking up at our school. Our campus is doing really well right now. All the kids are doing really great with masks and all the teachers and I think the community is really buying in. So I'm really excited about the way our campus is going right now. Um, so far updates, we too are going to be doing the um, beginning of the year assessment. Um, we're going to try to get that in. I think the deadline is October 16th. So we'll be moving forward with uh, getting those implemented um, as soon as possible. Just for us to be able to get a gauge of where we are so that we can kind of follow up and do uh, more benchmarking to see, you know, to get us caught up for this year and from last year for the gaps that we have. Um, we are actually very lucky we're having several remote learners come back. Uh, I think we have nine. Um, so we're, we're very excited about getting those kids back on campus and uh, learning in our face-to-face -face environment. So um, we're very excited about those kids coming back. Our open house, we've decided we're going to be doing that mid-October. We're going to try to do a Zoom, uh, a Zoom format, kind of like elementary did, um, just so that we, we're not bringing a bunch of new people from outside um, on the campus, um, unless the governor lists, lists things and we want to reevaluate that. But I think by right now in our current state, it would be just a better idea just uh, to try to keep uh, that to be a Zoom presentation. Um, right now, band, they're working on their uh, marching show, which will be, which will be um, in November, um, so we'll, we'll implement their first kind of show at halftime during the football games. So that will be what their show will look like um, for uh, their November marching show. Um, volleyball is doing fantastic, fantastic this year. I think they're 14-0, 4-0 uh, in district. Uh, they beat the big thing. They beat uh, Leon. In five, they went down the first two sets, came back all the way three and one. It was a pretty incredible uh, match. So, uh, Ms. told me to tell you, uh, they lost, they won 105 to 107 points, uh, 105 to 97 points. So it was a really tight game, and those girls fought hard. That was something else. Um, the uh, girls played Calvert tomorrow, and then Centerville on Friday. So they're doing really, and I think they're one in the state right now. So, pretty exciting. Football, they're doing a great job too. They uh, they got to uh, play Burton here last week, and uh, they won that game. It was pretty, a pretty great victory. So, both boys and girls programs are really doing well. Um, they'll get to play uh, Snook at Snook this Friday. So, a lot of great things going on. Great day to be a Bulldog. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Um, for the superintendent report, first thing I want to let the board know about, um, you'll see a lead next Wednesday, September 30th. If you uh, take the Navasota Examiner, you will see a public notice in there for our October board meeting. And that's related to the 313 agreement that we're um, working with Blue Jay, the solar company, right now. Um, so our legal counsel, Underwood, will be here in October. Uh, a couple things that will take place during that meeting. We have to create the reinvestment zone approve the application for tax abatement and consider the final agreement between uh, us, the district, and Blue Jay. And all that uh, requires a public notice for that meeting. So they want you to see that next Wednesday and be like, what's going on? Just a heads up. Uh, again, we paid them a fee last year. They're doing all the legwork. They're taking care of all this, but you'll be voting on this stuff uh, in, in October. Um, also, I believe Chris Grammer with uh, Colwell Consulting, which is a uh, consulting firm we talked to. He will probably be here or Skype in, uh, but again, just to present the financial impact information for the district and what this agreement would do for us uh, when it comes to taxes and, and stuff like that. So again, I just want you to be aware of that. If you see it in the paper next week, you know what it has to do with. Uh, my little COVID update. Again, we have one confirmed case right now at the secondary campus. We're very blessed that that student, we were notified, I believe it was Wednesday, that they had tested positive. And that kid had not been, been on campus since month or I'm not even sure they were here Monday. Right. So Friday of the previous week. So it's very, that's, I hate anyone that has it, um, but that's a blessing because we didn't create a lot of, a lot of, close, a lot of close contact 
or even infecting other students. So that was a blessing. Uh, Mr. Fowler mentioned nine remote learners returning back to face to face at the end ten. of the first. <laughs> ten. And you have ten? No, ten total. Ten total, okay. Because I had twelve. Oh, we have nine. Okay, then I have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we got more than the top ten left. Okay. So as this morning we had our administrative meeting, we had twelve returning back. So we've gone from fifty-one to thirty-nine, and there's more now. So that's a real plus too. We're getting them back from remote learning to face to face. And we're excited about that. Uh, speaking of COVID, another thing, uh, TEA has, has done a great job, and our principals are doing a great job using this. It's called Project Restore. So we know that the, the pandemic has been a traumatic experience. Uh, for students, and families, and teachers. And so TEA has put this, this, um, this video series together, Project Restore. It is eye-opening for teachers so that we can see, or educators so that we can see how to help kids through this traumatic situation. But it's also eye-opening for the educators for us to understand the trauma we've been through as well. So Ms. Sajewski is implementing that through her uh, faculty meetings, and they're talking about it as a group. That's working really well. Mr. Fowler is implementing that Monday during the in-service. Um, Monday's in-service, elementary is doing uh, parent-teacher uh, conferences, and the secondary is going to be working on Schoology and going through the Project Restore video series. It's a good thing to help us all try to get back on, on the level ground. Um, Excited about the beginning of the year uh, assessments. Th those are going to be good for us to get a, kind of a, a baseline on where we stand with state assessments and we can go from there with instruction. Uh, the K through two assessments that Ms. Dijewski mentioned, uh, we're trying to get those done in a timely fashion because as a board, as a team of eight, we still have the board goals we have to adopt. Remember, we have those in place for third grade reading and math CCMR, but we wanted to add another piece with early childhood. Those assessments will give us some data so we can finish writing those goals. So we have to get those written by January. Um, and then the last thing I have, uh, teacher incentive allotment. Uh, Monday of last week we had a Zoom meeting. Uh, I did and the principal was Ms. Harris with uh, Dr. Tammy Cruz. She's with the Texas Impact Network. That's the company uh, that's working with based with grant money and they're helping us put our plan together. So I just want to let you know that ball is rolling now with a teacher incentive allotment. Again though, we're cohort D, so that kind of stretches out the timeline. That means it wouldn't be until September 2023 that our teachers would see this extra compensation. So we'll spend a while putting our plan together. It has to be approved and then they have to go through a year of being evaluated before they earn these bonuses. The only thing I want to say about that, and I don't mean, mean to be a negative Nancy, but in our meeting, Dr. Cruz mentioned a couple of times that the state is talking about delaying that funding. So this system is a whole lot like um, the extended school year that we talked about, where the TDA says, you pay it up front and we'll pay you back. This is the same type of system. So we get into this and we pay our teachers the incentive. We need a budget for that because it's got to come out of a pot of money and then the state reimburses us. And they're already talking about those schools that are in cohort A, might, their funding might be delayed. So we'll see where that goes at the next biennium. It, it will be interesting to see if uh, teachers in the line of state around the time. If it does, though, the, the wheels are spinning and the ball's rolling and we're getting our act together with that. And that's all I have for us. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. No, ma'am. Uh, I believe those payments are coming. Um, I think the 23rd, yeah, 23rd, 24th, something like that. I asked Ms. Uh, TM last week, and she should be sometime this week. Our last, um, I looked today, as a matter of fact, Ms. Mollett, and our summary of finance showed that we would receive $127,000. It would be our settle up for last year. So what I think we get, like our settle up for last year, and then our first payment for this year, all like about the same time. Essentially, uh, several weeks ago, our summary of finance showed 197 as our as our settle up, uh, but that ESSER money has come out, and that's about $66,000 in there. So it was 
194. I'm sorry, it's come from 194 to 127. And that's, that's essentially what the state did was go in and adjust our data. And they changed our ADA. So that dropped that settle up by six to six thousand dollars. But the ESSER money is already there for this uh, 10 to pull down whenever we need it. So we already have that 66 for the settle up to be 127. If that doesn't change in between now and today's the 21st. I don't know if we get paid on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th. There's always a chance that can change. So, but that, the last time I looked at it, this amount, that's what it was. Okay. <laughs> Item number six, consideration of the Toronto County President for Texas Collection Agreement. Yes, it's just our agreement that um, Browns County Appraisal District acts as our tax, our tax assessor and collector. This is the agreement we have with them uh, each year that I've been here. I just ask the board to uh, approve uh, this agreement with Browns County Appraisal District Tax Assessment Collection.
we don't have any standard items, kind of assessments for a K1. R2, I mean, I'm not sure what the standard Where items assessments are. are. Right next to it. Oh, it under shows show. that we're using assessments. Are, so are those assessments coming out of the math or are they coming out of HMH? HMH. Well, it's on the K8 HMH, it's, it's the exact, well, 2 is the exact path. K through 8 has access to the unit test and the, and the voltage mark test that they have, performance based test through HMH. Right. And also, Guide and Math also provides the team space um, performance checks as well. Okay. So, uh, I just wanted to list any kind of material that our teachers would, you know, right. they have the readily available that they could use. Yes. Yeah. Um, I guess. I guess what I'd like to see is since the state is saying, you know, that, that we have to pay for two for a standardized test for reading, and we're doing the and class, which I'm really glad because it is consistent. Can we use it more than one? Right. So I'm just thinking it would be really nice if we could use a standardized test for math also. And since in class offers that, that might be a good option. Yeah, well, that's one of the things for math and, and for reading. Right. So give us some, some data. Yeah, here. Because right now we're just using really their uh, performance checks um, and their four cars and things like that. Right. 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 At the end of the six weeks, the teachers do like a big um, performance um, test, which is basically like, can you do this? They can demonstrate it, prove that they can do it. They bring on and rubric. That's kind of how we can track right now for math. Um, yeah, we'll, I mean, I agree. I should not do something like in class that can provide us with math. Okay, so then for the next page for reading, for ELA, we're showing that we're using the state adopted HMH, which is the one. We're using that for reading for K through, I guess, all the way to 12. Yeah, right? so it's our lesson option for high school last year. So it's continuous through the Okay, so we're using it for most of our school. Okay, so we have under there for um, assessments. For assessments and to it are the unit mass reading check test and in class for K through two, which we said we're going to use in class for reading, exact path. And I was I was wondering what Montes, okay, Montes and Hanil is useful. At their reading level, their benchmark assessment system, just for reading levels. Okay, so when I was looking at the materials, when I think of the materials earlier, Montes State Adoption, before it was adopted, I noticed that HMH has reading. Our reading levels that go with our state adopted well, program said as long as it fails on the state adopted anyway. Oh, well, everyone had been trained in it. It was the one that everyone decided to go with to start off with. We needed to start somewhere. Um, that was what was provided to us about five to six years ago. That's what we're going with. Um, we are looking at some of the different changes now that we've had. So I've talked to um, the rig, the H and H rep about their review test to kind of see what are the differences, how can we, you know, if we're looking at changing, if we're looking at keeping what are some of the pros and the cons. And uh, Heineman, who is the um, the company that has H M H, is also in Creepy that comes with the H M H. Um, Heineman is also the company that creates Fontes and Canal. So, mm -hmm. so Heineman creates the H M H Rigby level test and Fontes and Canal. So I wanted to find out what the difference was. Um, they were actually, so last year they told me that um, they're trying to make the thing more like Pontus and Canel, um, just because they like some of the things that, that they were going toward and like some of the things that Pontus and Canel got. So at that, at that point, I had a teachers um, pilot the Rigby, and this year we're talking about what they found and what they liked and what they didn't like. And seeing the updates of Pontus and Canel, did the updates match? Did they provide what we liked? So we're still looking at both. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not off the table. But when I did that pilot last year, we got the finish work early. So the teachers took a group of kids, and they gave one to the test to them, and they also gave them a few to kind of see the differences. So kind of in that latter stage. Because if I vote on this, I feel like I'm voting for this. I'm voting that I think it's OK to use one of the and I think it's OK to, I'm, I'm voting that this is OK. That's what I'm voting. You just have to list anything that the teachers can use and have access to with their curriculum. That's all the state wants. That's the list. It's anything that we're currently doing and we can pull and use. Otherwise, if it's not on here, you can't pull or manage and write any state projects. No, it's just 
what transparency that we'd like to have with the community and the parents that these are the these are the I just think it'd be more coherent to use something that you're using in class. So if you're using HMA to teach with, but that's what you would be using to level your kids with and see what level they're on and to do your daily lessons and all that kind of thing. That's just what I'm thinking. And my other question is, is that I don't see anything like um, you had a certain level of stay at the month of lines program you're using. So I guess my question is I didn't see anything on your instructional materials like about lines. So that's built into the What phonics program are? are we, our, our, teachers, event, our teachers voted to go with um, McGraw Hill. So, so all of our teachers in K, in K through whatever, or K through three, are using McGraw Hill phonics. That's the one that everyone voted on, yes. That's but are they the using it? Yes. They have the online access to it. They're all, okay. They're all using what did you say? Like the wrong the wrong heel okay. They're all using that. Okay, I guess that's the only question. I just I don't like the idea of having to say, I like this. You know, yeah. No, and it's I just a starting point to say that come that back and say these are not approved things. These are, I mean, it's just a starting point with the state to get that communication. Right, right. Yeah. And, and this kind of solidifies that we had to close the, in the spring again, that we would still do our funding. If we don't have this, we can't do our funding. We have to close in the spring. Right now, we have the grace period until December. They're going to fund this. So they'll look at this and they'll make edits and they'll say, "This is going to work." We'll come back and rewrite it. Add some things in it if we need to. If, if 
we get into the spring or even after November, I don't know, whenever the governor says, you have to go to remote learning, and we have to have this approved by you guys by TEA so we can continue funding. But it doesn't lock us in to deciding we're only going to do face-to-face. -face. Um, at some point in time, I don't know if that's a district, we don't we don't think about that. I know there's, there's several districts in the state of Texas uh, that have told their communities we're only doing face-to-face, -face. we're not doing remote at all, unless the state closes. Um, that might be something we discuss as a district with that is, uh, I'm, I'm worried about our teachers, I want to offer our teachers some relief, and, and we talk we talk about this on a daily basis, what can we do, I talk to other superintendents, some higher additional staff, which really isn't leading too much, we have to duplicate our staff in order for us to get relief to everybody. Um, so it's something maybe we bring to the table in the future is, is that we only want to offer face-to-face. -face. Um, and the word, so is that the same thing you are here from those different campuses, teachers? Yeah, it's been a lot. Um, I know Lindsay comes up and tells me what her teachers per se, and so, yeah. and I've heard it from other districts as well.
And then uh, ELAR K5 is McGraw Hill as well. Yes.
had one resignation. You see that was in your board packet from Ms. Cox. Um, just concerned about her health and her husband's health. Uh, she wasn't comfortable with the COVID situation. Um, so she decided to uh, retire. She was eligible for retirement. Um, also, just so you know, Mr. Fowler already has two interviews scheduled for Wednesday of next week. So we're going to try to move as quickly as possible. Uh, you will probably hear from me. We, we need to make a plan. If one of those two applicants is suitable, we need to hire them and I no longer have the authority to hire. So we may uh, sometime next week. Um, but I'll email you guys about that as we, as we put a plan in place. Uh, we need to hire. This week, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Not, not next week, it's this week. So in two days, he has two interviews. We may need to do a call meeting before the end of this week hire because we need to move quickly and get a certified teacher in that classroom for those kids. So I'll communicate with you guys uh, tomorrow and if at all possible we might have a call meeting first thing Friday morning so we can hire someone. Uh, but I'll, we need, kind of need to set it by tomorrow if we're going to have it Friday morning. So I'm going to set it meeting, but just so you know, neither one of the applicants are good fit, and then I will let you know the chance of that. But I've got to have the 72 hours posted, so I'm going to post it tomorrow for 8.30 Friday morning. Uh, and that will be the only agenda item, is to hire an applicant for junior high ELA. Um, but at the end of Wednesday, if the applicant is suitable, I will communicate with you guys and we'll answer that call for you. hope that all makes sense. Motion to accept the resignation of Ms. Cox. Make a motion to accept the resignation Motion by Carolyn. Second by Luke. Any discussion? Paper by your hand. Motion. Uh, one more motion.